Hello, you're watching the Telecom TV Summit on Telcos and Public Cloud. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content. What are the security implications for telcos of partnering with public cloud providers for their network hosting and workloads? And what is the best strategy for telcos to ensure both security and resilience? Well, to discuss these and other questions on securing telco applications in the public cloud, I'm joined today by Amy Zoyko, Director of Cybersecurity at AT&T. Hello, Amy. Good to meet you. And thanks very much for taking part in our summit. Could you start by telling us a little bit more about your role at AT&T and, and why the issue of security for applications in the public cloud is so important? Sure. Um, I manage a team that works on securing the 5G core and the 5G RAN. Uh, we also participate in uh, a number of standards bodies, uh, 3GPP probably being the one that's most familiar to the other telcos. Uh, and we participate and contribute to the security of both ONAP and ORAN, which are two very large open source initiatives. Great. Well, let me um, start by asking one of the fundamentals here, and that is, is the public cloud inherently more secure, less secure, or about the same as a telco's own network and operations? The security is really, it's different. Um, and it's different from a telco perspective because we don't manage the underlying hardware, the hypervisors, uh, the PaaS and the SaaS services that we're gonna rely on to, to actually run our workloads. Um, on the other hand, the public providers, they have experts, they have security experts and experts managing that infrastructure and it's in their interest to keep it secure. Um, I also wanna point out that while it's probably no more or less uh, likely that a bad actor is in the public cloud than in Telco's private network. Um, the problem is that the potential threat surface in the public cloud is actually expanded. Uh, so let me give two examples uh, of, of how this expands the threat surface. Um, the first one, the first example is that if you have a problem with the cloud provider's isolation controls, uh, this could result in the a problem in one company's workload actually affecting the telco workload. The second is uh, example would be a breach. So suppose that the infra the cloud provider's infrastructure is actually breached. Um, this could actually wind up affecting multiple companies' workloads. Okay, so as you say, it's different. Telcos have to be aware that there, there are significant differences here. Um, now, there's certainly a trend with more telcos looking to partner with the hyperscalers, and AT&T certainly set the pace here uh, with its uh, in a recent shift of, of assets to, to Microsoft Asia. Now, th there's many factors behind such partnerships, but what would you say are the biggest security risks faced by telcos when moving workloads and functions to the public cloud? So I think that the first one is just it's an operational risk and that is if you try to run your workloads as if they were on a private network you're going to face a lot of security problems and this was one of the learnings we had in moving a huge number of applications over to a public cloud you need to rethink and run it and use the tools that you're provided in the public cloud um, the second issue that is a true security issue is that you may have lack of visibility into the security posture of your workloads because the monitoring tools that you use in a private network may not really work well in public cloud um, having to do with the flat and, and it really has to do with the flatness of a private network versus a your network the your workloads and the structure of them in a public cloud where they're far more isolated and you don't really have this flat network um, the third issue, and I touched on that a little before, is that, um, but this is a kind of an extension of that, is that suppose one of your workloads in public cloud gets breached. Um, you need to make sure that you have architected the interfaces between your public cloud deployments and your private network deployments so that the, the breach of something in a public cloud does not cross that boundary and now start affecting your private network. 
So, Amy, it's very apparent that there's there's differences, and tokens need to be aware of the, the, the differences. The, the, the you know they're running over a different network, and you've also spoken there about the the lack of visibility at times. Now, given the need to maintain close control over their networks, even when using public cloud, what is the best operational and management approach that telcos can take for security? So, there are a number of things. Um, first, and and I think this is probably the most key, create standardized repeatable architecture patterns for your workloads. Um, don't try to do, don't try to craft each one very separately. You need to have that repeatability. Um, you need to encrypt everything, whether it's in transit, at rest, you need to be, you need to store your encryption keys securely. You need to actually manage your own keys. Don't use the underlying uh, cloud provider's keys. You need to supply your own, it's called supplying your own key. Um, this third issue is something I'm really passionate about, not just in the public cloud, but, but everywhere. You need, we need to be adopting a zero touch deployment and management strategy for workloads. Um, everything should be built off, should be deployed off of a build pipeline. Everything should be scripted into that build pipeline and tested to death before you actually start running those builds in production. Um, and I said before, you, you need to be doing this in your own private environment as well. Um, you need to start with this mentality of no one is ever going to log into command line of a, of a virtual server. They just aren't. Everything will be off of that pipeline. Um, another thing that you need to do is all of the security controls actually have to be part of that pipeline. So you're, you don't secure the, you don't set up the security controls after the fact. They are part of deployment. A, a good example is micro segmentation. So you set up all your firewall rules. And I, by the way, I still think of micro segmentation as firewalls. Um, you set them up as part of the deployment. Patching, you've got to really think about your patching strategy. And, and this goes back to where I said, nobody logs into command line. So I don't push patches by logging into to command line and uploading new software. I actually incorporate that into my build scripts. I run my, my pipeline, my CI CD. I deploy, I deploy the new stuff and I delete the old. Um, another thing I think that we really need to be thinking about, um, and someone mentioned this to me the other day, this old strategy of N minus one, where Yo's kind of used one version behind to make sure that all the bugs have been worked out. We can't do that anymore. We've got to be running on the latest versions of the operating system, your latest versions of all your software packages, and the latest version of all your security tools. And in order to do this, telcos are really going to have to adopt this notion of continuous integration and deployment because Anything else, you're, you can't work in that environment. The changes come too frequently and they're not synchronized with one another because you're getting, your, you're getting these updates and these changes from lots of different sources. Just out of curiosity there, Amy, you know, why can't you uh, run uh, like an N, N minus one approach? Why, why can't you sort of deploy the, the, the version that, that's with the bugs ironed out, hopefully, and not the, the most recent one? Well, think of Log4j. Um, there was a the latest version. The latest version, and by the way, every and as we discovered, everything you know, n minus two through n minus the dawn of time, actually was susceptible to that vulnerability. It wasn't good enough to take the n minus one that didn't have too many vulnerabilities because it had a critical one. Um, so you, you've just got to be able, you've got to stay on that latest version because the latest version is where the fix will have taken place, and this is especially true of software you release new versions and that's how the fixes get into into product into that software they don't get into that software because somebody went and twiddled version n minus one thanks amy um what about the impact here of sovereignty you know what market specific data management security considerations should telcos know about before hosting their data on public cloud platforms i mean for example you know how different are the rules between europe and the us and are there any organizations or industry bodies that could help telcos in uh, advise in this manner i kind of i think i touched on this a little earlier but um it bears repeating your technicians are really not going to understand and know all of the nuances behind 
running services, say in Europe or in the US or Asia or somewhere else. Uh, this is where you absolutely have to rely on your legal experts and your supply chain experts, where they're going to understand, they're going to understand all the rules and regulations. They're going to know workloads that can and cannot move to a public cloud. Um, those are the, it, you, I cannot emphasize enough that they have to be part of the partnership with the technical team to make sure that we're not making mistakes, to make sure that we're using, that we're actually complying with whatever the local jurisdiction says to do. Um, and you mentioned about uh, industry bodies. So one good example of an industry body that I think has done an excellent job and, and I've worked with their standards for a number of years now um, is the payment card industry. They publish their PCI DSS documents and those cover both uh, what you do say on a private network and what you would do in a public cloud. Uh, they provide all of the security controls that you have to implement in order to, to handle payment cards. Um, and they also actually provide a PCI certifications for public cloud, which is a, a really interesting. And it does help a telco. It, it actually helps anybody in industry in understanding which public clouds you can leverage, which ones you should avoid. That's interesting. Um now, you spoke earlier about cloud native tools and, and practices, for example, the, the, the need for CI, CD. Um, if telcos, and let's assume they do, if telcos are moving workloads and functions to public cloud platforms, what does that then mean for the skills and requirements and composition of their data security teams? Are there certain specialist skills that are needed to manage the, uh, the relationship and interactions with the public cloud providers? Yes, uh, there really are. Uh, the first one is, and I said it before, your legal and supply chain absolutely have to be part of your technical team. You have they, you have to be working closely with them to make sure that up front you're putting the right things in public cloud. You're consider you're considering the right controls that have to be in place in order to run that in in a public cloud. Um, this really affects telcos a lot because. There's, a, there's federal regulation in most countries around what telcos can and can't do. Um, the second is you need to retrain your architects and your operations people. They need to become public cloud subject matter experts. Um, you work differently in public cloud. You need to understand, you need to understand how to work there, how the different controls are enabled, um, how the pipelines over in a public cloud work. So they need to be, they really need to be subject matter experts, not just somebody who, hey, I can go up and spin, a, spin up a VM. Um, and the third thing that is critical is to have the build pipeline expertise. When you move to cloud, everything is code, absolutely everything. And everything can be automated. So you need to have these automated automation specialists who can who truly understand how to do that in public cloud and can turn all of the things that people used to do by hand or following methods and procedures, turn that into code, turn it into something that can run so that you don't wind up with fat finger uh, mistakes or skipping steps, um, just not really considering all of the things that you had to do to, to move a workload to public cloud. And there we go again, as you say, you know, this is a different environment for tacos. They really have to be aware of the, the differences here. So Amy, as well as malicious threats and, and damages, what about the risks to network and service resilience? I mean, for example, we've seen, we've seen how incorrect software updates or flawed code can cause service disruption. What about the factors that can now be outside of the direct control of telcos. How does a telco ensure security and resilience when using the public cloud? First, you just need to realize that the large public cloud providers, they all have solutions for both local and geographic resiliency. So you have to understand how they work, um, what the implications are, um, how you are going to plan your failover in, in the case of, a dis of some type of a disaster, whether it be man-made or a natural disaster. Um, so you, you need to factor that in. Is it an automated flip? Does somebody actually have to go in there and physically enable, you know, flip a switch to make sure that it happens? You know, a, dis a human decision is made at that point. Um, I think that one thing I'd like to point out about security uh, of these is that an operator really needs to make sure that when you're failing over to another location, um, 
suppose this was caused by an attack, the, the resiliency problem, that the new deployment doesn't allow the attack to continue. Um, so for example, you need to use your build pipeline to automatically spin up clean instances of the resources. You need to make sure that you have um, put isolation on those so that they no longer are talking to, they can't talk to the older resources that were either somehow compromised or just are missing. There's no dependency on that. Um, and then this is something that is really important for working in any type of a virtualized environment. When you no longer need a resource, you need to make sure that it's been deleted. Um, or in the case of attacks, sometimes it just needs to be quarantined because you're gonna to need to do some type of post-mortem on that, but, but you need to get it into a quarantine or deleted state so that it can no longer be, be used in an attack. It can no longer be, it's no longer affecting availability. Great advice there, Amy. Thanks so much indeed for taking part in our summit on tocos and public cloud and for sharing your views on cybersecurity. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. I've enjoyed the opportunity to share.